All right, so this wraps up uh, the lecture on dinosaur, the rise of dinosaurs, and a look at dinosaur physiology. So as I talked about in class, there's substantial evidence that dinosaurs were probably warm-blooded, like today's mammals and like today's living dinosaurs, the birds. Um, there's actually a lot more evidence than I talked about, but uh, I used to give an entire lecture about that. Even that one was a condensation. I spend four lectures on it in my dinosaurs class in GL 104. Uh, but if you want more information, you can check out the lecture notes for that class. But in any case, uh, it does look that dinosaurs in particular reached sort of the levels that modern mammals did, large bodied mammals at least, in terms of their physiology. Uh, and there's even recent evidence that suggests that they and the therapsids, the proto mammals, show greater environmental tolerances than Pseudosuchians, uh, that is the proto-crocs, um, at least in the Triassic. So this is where the proto-crocs are. Oh, this was supposed to be color code coordinated, and it's no longer color coordinated. And this is showing mean annual temperatures in which most of them are found, seasonal variation, uh, mean annual precipitation and seasonal variation in precipitation, and they have narrow, nor, narrower ranges for the Pseudosuchians, even at the time they're the dominant group, compared to ornithodirons, that is dinosaurs and pterosaurs, or therapsids, and instead Pseudosuchians are more comparable to the temnospondyls, that is the big amphibians of the time. So, there is, however, some evidence, and I mentioned the bone growth, um, bone growth and uh, bone texture data that suggests that all archosaurs had at least moderate levels of endothermy, and indeed, living crocodilians have parental care of the young, uh, which is a trait otherwise we see mostly in endotherms. Um, so it looks like that overall, archosauriforms, so archosaurs and their closest relatives had moderate levels of endothermy, elevated above a cold-blooded animal, but not to the level of modern birds or mammals. And that modern crocodilia actually is a slowdown, a cool-down, having to do with their new mode of life, which is staying around in ponds and streams and lakes and being an ambush predator where you don't want to be burning a lot of energy. At the rise of Ornithodira, though, we see lots of evidence for increases in endothermy. We see miniaturization. The early members were very tiny. As I'll talk about when I talk about bird origins, this may be where fuzz shows up, a fuzzy body covering. Complex bone associated with rapid, very rapid growth rate and increased locomotion and respiration adaptations. So it looks like we have an increase of endothermy at the base of, uh, of Ornithodira, pterosauromorphs and dinosauromorphs, and then maybe various groups within Dinosauria and Pterosauria that achieve a higher level that actually reaches the level of mammals. Now, that said, even if it's warm-bloodedness that's the key to dinosaur success, why didn't it pay off in the Triassic? As I showed before, Pseudosuchian archosaurs are more diverse than dinosaurs are during the Triassic. So early Triassic, middle Triassic, and these are the two parts of the late Triassic. So Pseudosuchians, as they're labeled here, Cruotarsans, are more diverse than Avon Metatarsalians, which are Ornithodirans at that time. And ecologically included dominant roles like the big apex predators of that time. Now, dinosaurs do get more diverse as we move from the early part of the late Triassic, that are the, that's these forms, into the later part of the late Triassic, but still with very limited numbers of forms compared to what would happen later on. By the way, this is a one meter scale down here. We see a few larger predators, but they're not the apex predators. We do see, however, a big expansion in the number of large bodied herbivores. And in the last decade, there's a suggestion that the reign of the dinosaurs may have began with rain. There's geological evidence that during what's called the Carnian Age of the Late Triassic Epoch, there was a period of enhanced rainfall. It may have been triggered by 
uh, volcanic eruptions in various parts of the world. And there's lots of sedimental logical evidence of an increased amount of rainfall, increased amount of fresh water coming into the uh, seas and so forth. And this is called the Carnian pluvial event. So Carnian, again, is the time period in which it's in. The first part of the late Triassic pluvial means of rain. Now, prior to the CPE, there was a wide variety of medium sized and small bodied herbivores in the environment. There were various therapsids, we see some here and here. There were some non archosaur members of Diapsida, and there were small bodied sauropodomorphs among the dinosaurs, as well as some of the, you know, this is one of the smaller therapsids. And there were sauropodomorphs, but they weren't particularly large. However, after the CPE, we start to get really big sauropodomorph dinosaurs. And they can reach high up into the trees, which seems to have been their selective advantage. And so the suggestion is that the CPE, the Carnian pluvial event, this wet episode, led to something that we actually do observe, a diversification and expansion of new groups of trees. And this new resource base allowed a group that could exploit it to become more diverse and uh, more abundant. And that group was a group that was literally and figuratively in a good position to get bigger, and that's dinosaurs, and in particular, sauropodomorphs, which got larger and larger and larger and able to reach up into the trees. And here we see, uh, scaled to 100%, the different groups of, predator, of, sorry, of herbivores around during the lower Triassic, the early Triassic, the middle Triassic, into the late Triassic. This is the Carnian pluvial event, and we see the number of dinosaurs greatly increasing. Dinosaurs are in red here, and it's reflected in the styles of trees that are evolving at that time. Now, I do want to throw a caveat in here, and that is the North American data do not show this. At least they don't show this strongly. We don't see good signs both of the environmental changes or the increase in sauropodomorphs in North American skeletal data, or uh, in the case of plants, uh, 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 paleobotanical data, or in the footprint data of the, the dinosaurs, so, uh, or in other animals. It looks like Pseudosuchians in North America at least seem to be pretty abundant all the way to the end. But for most of the world, before the Carnian pluvial event, dinosaurs are rare, they're small, and it's other reptile groups that dominate. And then afterwards, some of the dinosaurs start to get larger, both among the herbivores and a few of the carnivores, and we've lost some of the early more primitive reptile and other amniote groups. So that by the end of the late Triassic, we still have big Pseudosuchian predators, but we have much bigger sauropodomorph herbivores. But what about this end? So there is one of the big five mass extinctions that I haven't covered yet, well, until now, and that is number four of the big five, and that's the Triassic-Jurassic event. And it turns out this one is linked to an environmental, or to a trigger, um, a trigger that is a causal agent that is physically very close to us. Now, as you drive up and down basically the 95 corridor from the Carolinas through New England, and if you continue on into Canada, along the eastern part of Canada, it's very common to find these regions where reddish rock is really common. You might find them around here near Dulles or near uh, Gettysburg, uh, the battlefield. Um, parts of Manhattan have this. Um, Connecticut and Massachusetts up the Connecticut River Valley has this. Um, and you have both reddish sedimentary rocks, lake deposits, stream deposits, and so forth, and reddish Plutonic igneous rocks, but very shallow plutonic igneous rocks, as well as volcanic rocks. The Palisades of the Hudson region, for instance, are some of these. And these collectively represent a series of rock, uh, bodies of rock called the Newark Supergroup. And what the Newark Supergroup was is our deposits and igneous, uh, igneous rocks formed as Pangaea, the one world continent, began to rift apart. And as it's pulling apart, there was a large igneous province event, a flood basalt event, except in this case, it wasn't a flood basalt event that blanketed the huge region, although it did blanket some regions. It's also 
tearing apart the supercontinent. And the rift basins are the spot in which the lakes are forming and the sediments accumulating and volcanoes are going off. And that's what's left as the Newark supergroup. But one part of the Newark supergroup, well, we don't call it that anymore, rifted so big, it's still rifting apart. And it's the Atlantic Ocean. So in fact, the Newark supergroup is just the remnants, as I say, it's the stretch marks of the birth of the Atlantic. Now, this volcanic episode is called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, or CAMP, C-A-M-P, CAMP. It is the largest flood basalt event that the Earth had since the Siberian Traps. It's much bigger than the Deccan Traps at the end of the Cretaceous. And with it, just like with those other large igneous province eruptions, there was a huge burst of sulfur compounds and also of carbon dioxide. So basically, it replayed the events of the Siberian Traps eruption just 50 million years later. Here we can see its extent in eastern North America. There's also deposits related to it in South America, northern South America, in northwestern Africa, and in southern Europe. And here's all of those places together. You can see the extent of this region. And this outburst of both cooling gases, in the case of sulfur, greenhouse gases in terms of carbon dioxide, and other effects produced the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event of 201.3 million years ago. And although, as I talked before, that during the late Triassic is when dinosaurs shared the Earth, this event wiped out most of the Therapsids, except for the tiny-bodied early mammals. And it wiped out most of the Pseudosuchians, except for the tiny body ancestors of crocs. And it, but most of the dinosaurs survived. And so the dinosaurs looked left, they looked right, there was no competition, and they were able to take over. So this event at the end of the Triassic, we've got global warming, uh, we have deep water anoxia, there's uh, hydrogen sulfide gases and so forth. And one of the consequences was the restructuring of the terrestrial world so that dinosaurs could take over. And here's traces of the high carbon dioxide peak. And sul hydrogen sulfide gases mixing in the shallow water. There even is some evidence that it started off with a real cool phase. So we saw that also with the Siberian traps, evidence of a pulse of real cold generated by the sulfur gases, followed by in intense global warming. So the dinosaurs had no real rivals left. Eventually, you know, my, you might be thinking, oh, I know about giant crocodiles during the age of dinosaurs. Yeah, they evolved tens of millions of years later. The early croc relatives only one to two feet long. The earliest mammals only about five to ten centimeters. That's two to four inches long. <clears throat> now, during the Triassic, the long-necked sauropodomorph dinosaurs were already undergoing their expansion of diversity, and they just pick up with that. The other groups, the theropod dinosaurs and the ornithischian dinosaurs, now was their chance, because the pseudosuchians that have been keeping them down now were gone. So for the most part, although there were adaptive advantages that allowed some of the dinosaurs to expand in their diversity, during the Triassic, it really looks like, once again, the success of dinosaurs, though the success of any group, comes because another group didn't survive a mass extinction event or didn't survive it well. So extrinsic factors, the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction takes out the occupiers of the niche, that is, the Pseudosuchians, and it's the dinosaurs that were the ones who were capable of taking advantage of it. So yes, they had the advantage of having a higher metabolic rate than the Pseudosuchians, but it wasn't like they were out competing the Pseudosuchians in their own time. Rather, their advantages allowed them, as one of the survivors, to take over. But from the beginning of the Jurassic to the end of the Cretaceous was when dinosaurs ruled the Earth. And just to show a few of the things that happened afterwards, with the loss of the apex predators of the Triassic, it's the theropod dinosaurs, the carnivorous dinosaurs, that took over. And these are shown to the same scale. So by the early Jurassic, we now have the apex predators are dinosaurs as big as the largest of the Pseudosuchians were and would soon be bigger. 
but far faster, far more agile, and with a higher metabolic rate. We can even see here footprints from the early Jurassic showing that there were some giants at that time. The Ornithischians, too, the bird-hipped beaked dinosaurs, also radiate out new armored dinosaurs and new types of fast-running, small-bodied forms, which then became the foundation for the adventure of the horned dinosaurs and the duckbills and the dome heads. And the sauropods, the giant members of the large, of the long-necked plant-eating sauropodomorphs, they undergo a big radiation. In fact, there's a second volcanic pulse. Um, that seems to have been helpful in a second expansion of them. So originally we had the Carnian pluvial event, which seems to be triggered by volcanism, but mostly was a rain event. That caused them to become much bigger, the sauropodomorphs. And now within the sauropodomorphs, the sauropods get really big. In the later part of the early Jurassic, there's a series of volcanic uh, pulses that produces again environmental change that produces even larger trees, and that produces even larger sauropod dinosaurs. So here's one of the oldest members of that group. So sauropod dinosaurs at this point are the largest land animals that have ever existed and within a couple of tens of millions of years would be larger than any animal that had existed at that point in Earth history, both on land or sea. And our next lecture is going to look at how that was accomplished and how so many groups of dinosaurs got so big, at least as adults. So we'll look at dinosaur growth, dinosaur babies, and the weird effects on dinosaur ecology about having so many body sizes. Take care, see you then, and hope you have a good spring break.